So quite honestly, it doesn't matter what Houston does. It's what does the president that follows me and probably the person that follows them, what do they inherit uh, from the time that I was here? This is Jeff Standridge, and this is the Innovation Junkies podcast. If you want to drastically improve your business, learn proven growth strategies, and generate sustained results for your organization, you've come to the right place. Welcome to the Innovation Junkies podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Innovation Junkies podcast. I'm Jeff Standridge. Hey, it's Jeff Amarine. Great to be back. How you doing, man? You know, I'm glad to be here. It's a nice spring day, and I'm looking forward to some warm weather and, and some time outside, for sure. Yeah, let's talk about our, our episode today. We've got a fantastic guest, uh, Houston Davis. Dr. Houston Davis is president of the University of Central Arkansas. Uh, prior to coming to UCA, Dr. Davis was interim president of Ken- Kennesaw State University, and, but he also served as executive vice chancellor and the chief a- a- academic officer. Can't hardly speak today. Uh, the chief academic officer of the University System of Georgia. Uh, He's been in Tennessee, Oklahoma, Georgia, and now Arkansas. And I can tell you uh, by being an alumnus and an adjunct professor and and, uh, a friend of of the University of Central Arkansas, we are absolutely so fortunate and so pleased to have Dr. Davis and Jenny uh, as as our first family, so to speak. So President Davis, welcome to the podcast. Hey, good to see you guys. Always great to talk to the two Jeffs. <laughs> One the, is the never Jeffs, enough, right? <laughs> we get referred to as the Jeffs. You would be surprised how many times we get referred to as the Jeffs. It, so even it, when it, Reagan it, sends us podcast notes, she she addresses us in emails. Hey, Jeffs. So Exactly. Well, it makes it easier okay. for everybody. They only have to remember one first name. Somebody actually That's said, you know, not long ago when when Jeff had a different pair of glasses that we actually even resembled one another. When my goatee was a little a little uh, thicker and a little grayer uh, and he had a set of glasses that looked like mine, they were they were even confusing our looks. And I said, that's when it kind of crosses the line for me. Right. We had to make some changes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think old couples start looking and acting like each other after a while. So that curve will bend. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's been, that. it's been six years. Right. It's been yeah. six years. <laughs> That's right. Uh, well, well, listen, we're so glad to have you on this morning, President Davis. And one of the things that we like to do to kind of get the ball rolling is is it's a little whimsical, but we always like to have a random musing. And this morning, the question is, what is some stuff you wish that you had never eaten? Wow. Um, well, growing up, um, I, I, I grew up on a on, on a farm and uh, grew up in a family that uh, you you ate what was in front of you. Um, kind of you get what you get and you don't throw a fit sort of uh, perspective about food. As so I can say that uh, younger uh, years, I ate a lot of things that I might not have had choice to eat. But one of those, it just sounded so exotic. It was Rocky Mountain oysters. Um, and, and certainly, um, I, I can say ignorance is bliss. I can't say that they didn't taste good. Um, but it was only after finding out what they were, um, that it was a mental hurdle to get over at that point. Yeah. That's also called calf, one. also called calf fries. If you eat them in Texas, right? Yeah. I, I, I figured that your, 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 your viewers, um, could uh, probably Google Rocky Mountain oysters, and they would yeah. certainly uh, they get the picture. That's right. Well, that's Very one of good. those things that in the South where if it's fried, it's good, and if it's deep fried, it's even better. And Absolutely. deep fried Rocky Mountain oysters are probably all right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A lot of crust, on, a lot of crust on them. Um, yeah, that's right. You know, so similar to to Houston, I grew up on a on a, you know in a farm family, not specifically on the farm myself, and so. You know, I don't, I don't remember eating a lot of stuff that I wished I, I hadn't at that age. Now I've traveled internationally a lot, and you know, I once ate sushi from a gas station in São Paulo, Brazil, um, and and I I was fine, but I wish that my work colleague hadn't eaten it because he spent about fourteen hours in an ER getting IV fluids following. Um, but you know, I've had stuff in China that today I'm still not sure exactly what it is. Stuff in the Middle East. 
Um, but you know, it was real interesting. I, I went to, to Dallas with a group of folks uh, a couple of weeks ago and we were at this sushi restaurant and the sushi chef was preparing it kind of bite by bite for our group. And he was shaving off real thin slices of Wagyu beef. And then he would put it over kind of like a, a, a sashimi uh, over the rice and he would kind of flame kiss it with a little torch. And as he was slicing that Wagyu beef, I looked at it and I went, well, I've been eating that my whole life. That looks like spam. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, well, how about you, Amaran? Well, and I, I've had similar international experiences. I, ne I never will forget the time I was on Sheju Island. It was when I was doing some work in Korea and, uh, in the nineties. And, and I, the, the guy that was our contact there said, you just got to eat what's put in front of you. It's a sign of weakness. If you don't, I mean, there's a lot of cultural things there. And so we had, they had cut up uh, the baby octopus that was still recently alive. And this stuff was essentially crawling off the plate as we were eating it. And, and, and I went ahead and did it. And it was the only food I ever ate that actually kind of bit back on the way down. <laughs> <laughs> little suction cups and stuff but yeah. anyway you know I, I heard a guy one time talking about beef tongue and uh you know when you look at that in the in the grocery store it just looks so traumatic you know i mean it's it's horrible looking <laughs> but uh they, they say if you really prepare it right it's good and i heard a guy one time say i'll i'll use his vernacular and he said i ain't gonna eat nothing that might be tasting me back <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's, well that's probably words of wisdom yeah that's probably enough uh, of our random musings today. Um, Houston, as I said, so great to have you today. Uh, we'll, we'll let our, our listeners and viewers look up your background. We've talked a little bit about that, but let's just talk about maybe to kick things off your view of higher education, uh, you know, UCA, particularly at UCA as a comprehensive four year university and, and, and what you see the role that that university plays in our economy and workforce development and education and, and what have you. Let's start there because I know that's going to lead to a lot more uh, uh, robust conversation. Yeah, well, and I, I think, Jeff, it is a very interesting time to be uh, thinking about what the role, uh, especially public universities um, are in, in, in America and then, then the, the role just generally of tertiary education around the world. And I think UCA's story and where we find ourselves is a pretty good sample um, of where the majority of higher education is. And, and what I say to that is you've got 4,000 or so fully accredited institutions in America, and they range from highly selective, um, you know, private residential universities all the way through open access uh, universities, but the majority of schools kind of sit where UCA is. I mean, we we certainly uh, take great, great pride in our academic standards and and uh, and the quality of the degree, but we also have to play a role of serving as an access point. We are we are an opportunity for upward mobility. Every single day, we provide someone um, a chance to get that coin of the realm to earn their degree, and we know that's going to change their family tree because they're a first generation college student or or they're coming from a family where, uh, you know, they, they found themselves displaced in this economy um, and, and we're going to be a part of their way back. Um, I don't know that it's ever been more clear at a place like the University of Central Arkansas that that's something that we have to get out of bed every single day taking very seriously. Um, I'm not going to say that that hasn't been important from 1907 until now um, at our institution, but it's abundantly clear that this region of Arkansas, the state of Arkansas, some of the spillover beyond the borders of Arkansas, if UCA doesn't take that role very seriously, um, the state of Arkansas is not going to advance. So it's not just what we do educationally, but we do have to think about uh, being stewards of place. Uh, we have to think about what are we doing um, to drive economic development. We have to think about how is it that we are a part of stitching together a social um, fabric um, in our community and, and, and in this region uh, that allows people to know that they've got a home base that they can touch. Um, we have to do that because the next 50 years are going to demand it. Um, and I'm very proud to be uh, leading an institution that are our VPs, our deans, our directors of, of major units. I think that they get that and that's a part of the culture here. So let's talk about some of the initiatives, some of the things you have going on that you believe are kind of front and center or at the forefront of, of that uh, philosophy and, and that strategy? 
Yeah, I think a, a lot of it almost goes in this concept that I've thought about. We're um, as, as we take our traditional programs and our services, we've got to be focused on what can we do in an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary fashion? Um, how can we find some way to get one plus one to equal three? Uh, because there's always scarcity of resources. But, um, you know, one, one thing that's front and center with the two of you, you uh, partner with us um, in the work that UCA and Conductor do along uh, with the Startup Junkie Network. I mean, that is a way to leverage um, our intent, our scope of, of capacity, our scarce resources uh, into joining with you for that to be a multiplier effect. If we tried to do that on our own, there's no way that we could make the impact that we do. But I think that that's thinking that way over the last four or five years has allowed us to spend things like uh, the Arkansas Coding Academy. Um, uh, simple in concept, I mean, allowing people to come back and retool and retrain, but that is, that's computer science, that's management information systems, that's um, a little bit of cyber security, Th those units coming together to be able to deliver something that sometimes is about getting a degree and other times is just about retooling and retraining, but all of that spins off within three years our new Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Data Sciences spins off a standalone BS in cybersecurity. Um, none of that happens without thinking in an interdisciplinary way and then working with external partners um, to figure out what is it that UCA has? What do we bring to the table as, as a steward of those needs uh, to be able to think about the multiplier effect? Um, you know, not just in that space of information assurance, uh, our interprofessional teaching clinic is something that comes to mind. Um, you know, the health sciences, I think we, we certainly have thought about innovations that, that lead to simulation, but how do we really think about collaborations, um, not only within the multiple health sciences units, but in, with the industry? Um, that way students are learning in a real world environment. It's multidisciplinary. Um, it really is interprofessional um, in the approach. Um, so I, I don't want to don't want to keep kind of working down the list. We've got other others that we can talk about. But so much of that grows out of thinking in an interdisciplinary fashion. You know, follow up question to some of that is you know, it, it strikes me that that leadership in an academic institution where you've got so many diverse disciplines, so many different uh, backgrounds and, and skills in, in many instances is far different than than uh, a, a typical corporate setting where you you have maybe a few products or a line of products but they're all kind of related you have just so many different disciplines how does that impact your ability to lead and then to uh, to uh enact change what do you have to do in that environment where there's so many different diverse disciplines and opinions yeah well i, I think that one of the ways that i believe that you can do that is is thinking about applied research and applied service um, and it doesn't matter the academic discipline. I mean, you can um, you can be in 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 uh, College of Arts and Humanities and Social Sciences. You can be in the College of Business. You can be in the College yeah. of Education. Um, but go to Health Sciences. Every single department can think about what is it that we're doing in the classroom. What is it that from a freshman up through senior year and into graduate study that we're doing in the classroom, inspiring excellence in the classroom. But then finding some way to inspire and show that student how to take that knowledge from the classroom and apply it to the world. Um, and I think that um, I like to think very broadly about things like innovation and service learning. I think those two things are kindred spirits because uh, they're about um, taking the tools that you have in your toolkit and, and how can you do something to make what's in front of you slightly better. Um, or maybe even to make a substantial leap to, to make uh, you know, a tremendous change with what's in front of you. But either way taking the classroom, apply it. I, I think about things like uh, nutrition family sciences. I was reading something a little while ago about uh, what they're doing um, to almost apply extension services um, to a variety of community actors, a lot of those nonprofit, uh, most of those obviously human services centers. Uh, but to take what our students are learning and then putting those students in places where they are making a difference with their knowledge. Um, in the end, I mean, that's what we want them to be able to do is walk across the stage and get a degree uh, from the University of Central Arkansas and then make a difference in the world. Um, when we think about uh, extending our services, um, applying that knowledge in real world environments, I mean, service learning to me is nothing more uh, than finding a way to, to take knowledge um, and use it in an innovative way. 
um, to, to take um, take a new skill set, take take some data point that you've learned and then find a way to, OK, then what is it that humanity is going to benefit from? Um, chemistry and biology, I mean, good examples. They're always involved in field research, but to what e uh, extent are they making certain that the state of Arkansas and then um, those that are entrusted with environmental resources here in the region um, are benefiting from that knowledge and that work? Um, I do like it um, that we think about what happens from a curricular standpoint, but there's a co-curricular and an extracurricular that is about applying that knowledge externally. So I know in 2018, you launched uh, what you've referred to as the uh, as the ROI initiative. Tell us a little bit about that. And, you know, it was fortuitous. And I was just talking with Jeff about this uh, before we got on the, the, the podcast. But it was fortuitous that you started doing that for a future event. And it actually helped uh, prepare the university and, and uh, what have you for the for the pandemic that came about. So talk a little bit about ROI. What is it and, and what have you done there and 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 anything you want to share relative to that? Sure. No, thank you. I'm always excited to talk about ROI. I hope that your, your viewers don't fall asleep during this portion of the program. Um, ROI is uh, stands for Resource Optimization Initiative. Um, I named my first puppy puppy, so I'm not a very creative person. So that's not the best <laughs> name in the world. But um, ROI really grew out of, um, you mentioned my time in Georgia um, as chief academic officer of that system. And again, very complex from the from the, the research universities through state colleges. But one of the things that we were doing was having to reimagine um, the role and scope of all, at that point, it was 35 institutions. Now it's 27 because of consolidations that have happened. Um, what's the role of scope of those institutions in the communities that they serve? And that can be a, a small one or two county area of Georgia all the way through UGA and Georgia. They serve the world. Um, so I, I know in coming to um, a place like UCA, applying those those principles, um, it's thinking about what's the scope of our reach and how is it that we're going to make certain that UCA not only is set up now, but for challenging times in the future, um, that, that 10 and 15 and 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 years from now, UCA is set up to thrive and continue making a difference not only for Arkansas, but to, to borders beyond. Um, that means applying a lot of principles that quite honestly, I mean, if you're working with businesses on their business plans, uh, you know, I'm certain that you talk on a regular basis that you've got to think beyond the next year. You've got to think mm -hmm. beyond probably your lifespan of engagement with this. Mm -hmm. business. Um, I always say that, um, always preached that successful presidents in the end are going to be judged by what are the conditions that their successors, um, receive as opposed to what they do during their time. So quite honestly, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what Houston does. It's what does the president that follows me and probably the person that follows them, what do they inherit uh, from the time that I was here? Um, ROI grows out of uh, zero-based budgeting. Um, it grows out of uh, applying revenue-centered management, thinking about um, where are there subunits of the university that are that are growing, that are that are bringing in revenue. So making certain that we're directing resources toward that effort, um, and it grows out of this is just old grandma advice. It's putting a name and a function to every dollar in your budget. None of that, guys, is complex. But I would think that you probably would agree. I hear all the time people say, well, higher education should run more like a business. Well, if we did that, we probably would go out of business because most businesses fail. Um, I think the reason that a lot of people won't apply those own business principles in a business setting is that it takes a lot of courage. You get to say no a lot. Um, you, you, you generally won't get many people that want to think about what are the implications of this decision three years, five years, 10 years from now, because most people only care about just getting to each July one. Um, but ROI really is about that, is every single one of those decisions, whether it be the zero-based function of putting a name and a function to every dollar or thinking about the revenue-centered management approach, um, every decision that we make will have a ripple one, three, five, and 10 years out. Um, so we think through that. And again, that, that 10 years out, I mean, that's... A, I don't want to make any news here, but that'll be beyond the time of me um, in the presidency. Heck, for all I know, one year out is is um, hopefully there's no pink slip on my chair tomorrow. Um, but by all means, um, we have to think that way. And again, it doesn't matter whether it's someone in a, in, a, in a private sector business making 
uh, decision making um, setting or it's somebody that's a president and a leadership team at a university. It's having the courage to make those decisions around that data and then thinking medium to long term about the implication of those decisions. Hey, folks, this is Jeff Amrine. We want to thank you for tuning in. We sincerely appreciate your time. If you're enjoying the Innovation Junkies podcast, please do us a huge favor. Click the subscribe button right now and please leave us a review. It would mean the world to both of us. And don't forget to share us on social media. So I've been associated with UCA for almost 40 years now, and I'm, I'm one of those that you mentioned, you know, that, that changing family trees, first generation college student, and, and, or, or I would even say transforming a family tree. Um, that's not been the traditional uh, uh, strategic philosophy. Uh, that's a change. And, and, and it's a, and it's a, an assertive change, a, a good, positive, assertive change. How do you begin to get people to understand that, that maybe have never been exposed to that type of leadership within an institution? How do you, how do you get folks in the boat with you, so to speak? Well, uh, you know, one of the things that was very important to me, I mentioned that I, I, I'm applying a lot of the things that I, um, I certainly have learned in past roles. I've been lucky to have great mentors that um, have have, uh, have kind of shown me good tools of the trade. But it was really important that in January of 17, when I started, I didn't just come in here pointing fingers and saying, hey, here's what we need to do. Uh, because the reality was I needed to get to know our community and I needed to get to know our university. Um, and I think that I would tell any leader that's stepping in, even if you know the winds of change are facing higher education in every university and college in America um, is, is dealing with this. Um, it's, it's very important for you to uh, not just apply, um, apply a change model just because you've seen it work in one setting. You need to make certain um, that you're addressing real issues that this university is facing. Uh, and I'd say the first 120 days or so um, on this job, uh, you know, good Lord gave you two ears and one mouth. You should probably use those proportionately. Um, I did a lot of listening. Um, it was uh, it was as much was there an awareness of things like the enrollment cliff um, that was coming to higher education um, in 2025, 2026 and 2027. I mean, that's something that's much talked about now. But you go back to 2017, there weren't a lot of people in higher education talking about or thinking about it, because, again, that was a decade away. Why, why are we worried mm -hmm. about that? Um, but I did find that there was uh, an emerging conversation here about, hey, the, the future um, is going to be challenging for public and private higher education, and, and we need to be thinking long term. So that was good. I also found um, in this culture that I inherited, um, it, was, it was a place that wasn't afraid to try things. I mean, Jeff, you certainly, uh, Stanbridge, um, you've been uh, around UCA longer than me. I mean, you know that uh, things like uh, UCA Honors College, I mean, starting in the early 80s, we were the sixth public university in America to launch a standalone honors college. We were one of the first public universities in America um, to go to residential um, learning communities. Um, a lot of what you uh, hear nationally now that's in the student success space and, and reimagining things like remedial and developmental education and the like, um, UCA was one of the leaders nationally. These are all things that started way before I got here. So there was, there was a, a culture of innovation, if you will, um, at UCA uh, relative to higher education um, standards for sure. So I, I found in those first 120 days um, that although I knew I probably was going to have to have a change management sort of focus uh, to my tenure here, uh, what I found was a general willingness to be in that space. Um, but I also got loud and clear that there needs to be a lot of openness and transparency. Um, it probably has been a little disarming um, to some on our campus that from 2018 forward, so my second year, as we started, became known as ROI later, um, that it was just an open book. Um, I, I, wanted, I want as many people to come forward and as many budget managers on this campus to be a part of those conversations, because quite honestly, we're, we're in a boat at sea. We're going to find our way to shore, but we're going to do that together. Um, so I found that the more transparency, the better. Um, and again, that's a little unsettling. It, uh, most, most people, and I can tell you my gut, I would 
sometimes rather just develop a unilateral solution and just tell people to do it. But that usually does not work out that well. Um, you, you generally are going to find your way uh, better. And there will be better ideas that will emerge when you bring others to the table. But I found transparency. I found listening. I found really identifying real issues that were going on here. And where were those opportunities that I knew that a lot of the ROI concepts um, would be helpful. And as you mentioned earlier, we were so very lucky because everything that higher education is dealing with because of COVID and the challenges to just get through furloughs and layoffs just to get through the end of fiscal years um, because they really are, are just bailing water at this point. Because of ROI, uh, we are one of the few uh, universities, forget Arkansas, any state that borders Arkansas um, that have managed um, FY20, FY21, FY22, and we will successfully manage all the way through FY27 because we're doing these things. And some sometimes you get lucky, but preparation has a lot to do with that. As well, and even as we, go ahead, Jeff. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, Jeff. I was going to say as a, as a follow on to that, you, you mentioned the, the difficulties or the challenges in leading through uh, the pandemic. What were some key sort of strategic insights where maybe you went through a process of triage, you had to implement things tactically in order to be able to just keep things moving. What were some key insights that are going to inform what you do going forward? Things that are going to stick that you had to do in a reactive way during the pandemic, but now you think, gee, that was a pretty good idea. I think those examples would be really helpful to our audience. No, absolutely. I, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. I mean, uh, there are 4,000 colleges and universities that had their uh, entire business model upended um, in, in January, February, and March of 20. Um, and, and there are a lot that still haven't found their way. I'm still shocked when I go to national meetings and I hear about campuses that still haven't had their, their faculty and staff return to work and they are still uh, remote two years into this. Um, the, um, it's hard for me to think about how that's going to affect their culture for the long term. Um, I, I think that uh, there are a lot of things that we um, learned from the moving in March and April of 20 to having to embrace technology and having to embrace open educational resources. Um, our faculty, many of whom, and, and I count myself among this, I mean, I, I'm chalk talk, I'm old school, I'm, I'm as old fashioned, I don't know that I'm a Luddite, but I'm, I'm not too far away from it. Um, but uh, our, our collective faculty that some of which might have uh, even been hesitant to utilize their tools like email all of a sudden found themselves having to utilize the basics of Blackboard, the basics of open educational resources and um, and, and, and electronic resources that our, our Taurus and library invest in to integrate those into their courses. Um, even though those classes came back to face to face, even really is in the fall of 20 and, and by spring of 21, most of those faculty found themselves back in a face-to-face -face setup, I think what we found was they those tools that they were forced to embrace because of what the pandemic did in April and May and June of 20, they're still integrating those tools in their courses, even though it might be a traditional face-to-face -face course. Um, I think that that has only improved the quality of teaching and learning. And again, that forced to adopt um, in, in one month of a year, uh, but now choosing to integrate um, at this point. Um, I think about, uh, Jeff, some of the things that uh, the way we found that we can serve students from an advising standpoint. Um, I don't know that we ever would have thought about using Zoom and Google Meet and other tools uh, the way that we have for um, academic advising appointments, for financial aid appointments, um, and even to counseling center appointments. Obviously, I mean, we, the, there, we don't want to do um, do, do our, 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 all of our counseling appointments via technology. But uh, sometimes if a, if a student uh, can't uh, make a face-to-face -face for some reason, obviously life is always going on as someone is involved in their studies, knowing that there's a comfort level with being able to go to that virtual option uh, for a session or two. So, you know, the utilization of those tools, and again, something that seems, well, that's no big deal. That's not innovative. Well, at that time, um, that seemed crazy to us, but we found that it's enhanced our reach um, and it's it's utilizing time and calendar um, in a way. I'm really excited about that and I'm very excited about the fact that a lot of um, educational technology and OER is integrated in the classroom. So let's talk a little bit, maybe shift gears and talk a little bit about some of the impediments to innovation that you see, you know, not just in your organization, but in higher education that you've constantly got in the back of your mind, uh, those impediments and how to overcome them. What, what are some of those? 
Well, I tell my students all the time that if you if you think you've got two options before you, you better add a third option. The most powerful and most likely option is the status quo. Um, and people forget that all the time that uh, you, you'll you'll run around the room and bang your head on the wall and usually you'll come back to the status quo win. So it has an inertia. It, it has a resistance. Um, that is, it's just powerful. Um, and, and even folks that think of themselves as innovators um, still uh, like the known better than the unknown. Um, so I, I think that's something that you always are going to deal with. And it does not matter whether we're talking about academic or non-academic units um, on the campus. Mm -hmm. The status quo is a pretty powerful thing. That's not a bad thing sometimes. I mean, sometimes there's a nice healthy tension between um, what's past and known and what's uh, what's in before you that's, that's the unknown. Um, I do think um, it's hard to run at the pace that sometimes we have to in this day and time of scarcity of resources. Um, we, we are continuing to ask more and more of an individual um, as we try and utilize human capital more efficiently. Um, we've got to remember, go back to that human word. Um, we've got to remember these, these, are, these are people that they've got, they've got their work life, but they've got their personal life. They've got stressors all their own. And that's something that I have to constantly remind myself um, that, that there's, there's a people aspect to this business that um, sometimes you can get so focused on things that are ROI and are, and are about innovation and it's about efficiencies um, that you've got to remember to go back and, and take the pulse of your people. Um, every, every once in a while, there's, there's got to be a breather because uh, folks can just be out of gas. So, but that's the, uh, it's the psychology um, of leadership. And again, I, I, don't, I don't know at, at, at the age that I am that I've, I've found the answers there yet. And, and I've, I met with each five-year period of my life, I'll, I'll get better and better at that. But I always have to remember in the back of my mind that we're, we're in a business of people and remembering impact on folks. And, and you can only stretch them so, so, so thinly uh, before that, that thread will break. Um, so that's that's a great challenge as we look into the future, too, because the, the financial challenges, um, the pressure on higher ed to perform, all of those are only going to increase. Um, but we've we've got to think about um, how are we utilizing our people? We're a people based business. Um, and then how can we make certain to build bridges through those challenging times? So as we think about, you know, and I sit and watch what's going on at the university, you know, you've you, we've got we're now, you know, endemic or you know hopefully knock on wood post pandemic uh, and the and but still have some challenges there the 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 ROI initiative that you have going on the cliff that's out there in two three four years um, you know the the need to serve the workforce uh, and talent rather I should say needs of our state uh, a, a very large capital campaign uh, to, to set the university up for success into the future all of those things going on, um, two questions, maybe as we start to round this thing out. First question is, how do you manage all of that? Well, one thing is I talked about being transparent. I've, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about this. Um, a lot of my messaging and a lot of my when I'm, I'm talking, not only in campus forums, but I've got to start getting into smaller groups. I mean, getting into within the colleges, within the departments, um, talking in a multi-year sort of frame for an understanding of, look, we now know um, we knew what the plan uh, was likely going to call for to get through that period of enrollment cliff in 2025, 2026, 2027. We now can really isolate how much of that acceleration to those conditions are directly because of enrollment drops by different cohorts because of the pandemic. So uh, I'm making up a number here. We know we know that, hey, we had a, a dollar challenge that was going to come to us in 2025. Well, now we know that 60 cents of that dollar is already here because of what mm. COVID did to a moment. Mm. Um, and to be able to explain as well at this juncture, that 60 cents in 23, 24, that, that we thought wasn't going to come until 25, 26. Um, but again, I've got to solve the puzzle of how do you do that? I mean, I mean, in a very transparent way, but but not as demoralizing. Um, that is is about um, maybe making it empowering that, hey, look, we're comfortable about talking about this because I will say um, and I'm not talking about any specific higher education institution, but my colleagues are going to sweep it under the rug year to year to year. Uh, most of them are only thinking about managing this one year at a time. We can't do that if we want UCA to thrive as we look to the future. Very good. Second question and, and last question, unless Jeff has a follow up, is what keeps you awake at night? Oh, goodness. Um, 
you know, honestly, I mean, you got 10,000 students and 1,300 faculty and staff. I mean, you're always thinking about it. at some point in time, somebody's doing something they're not supposed to be doing. I mean, those, there's that keeping me awake at night, but I don't think you'd ever get any sleep as a president if you dwelt on that too much. Um, you know, I, I tell people all the time that, you know, I'm lucky to work in an, in an industry where you know you make a difference every day. Um, you know that you've got challenges to deal with. But again, we've got a roadmap to be able to deal with that. To me, that's somebody will ask me all the time, is it hard to be a president? And I don't know it's hard. I mean, these are first world problems that we're talking about. Um, but the things that keep me up at night are, um, and the bad days are, are when you um, deal with maybe a, a student suicide. Or, or you deal with a, an unexpected loss of someone due to due to a you know health condition or, or, or a car wreck. I mean, th those are the heavy moments in higher ed. I mean, so I, I don't know that I fall asleep every night worrying about those sorts of things. But but if but if you want to know what weighs heavy uh, on me from day to day, that's it. Um, I know I believe in our people. Um, I believe in our plan going forward. Um, I feel very confident about where UCA is short, medium, and long term. Um, so that I, I, I sleep easy. Um, but, um, you know, when, when you're, uh, when you're president of a university, there's an aspect to it that, yeah, you're, you're president of a university, but around the clock, 24 or seven, you're mayor of a small town and there's the mm -hmm. industrial organizational psychology of being mayor of a small town and looking out for your, your, your town, your people. Um, uh, so th those are the things that weigh heavily. I just, I just hate when, when tragedy befalls a campus and it, and it does, I mean, large universities, you're going to have things to happen, but, um, you, you worry about those things all the time. Everything else is just work and task. Very good. Jeff, any follow-ups from you? Well, it just, I mean, just a commentary. I mean, Houston, it's, it's obvious to those of us who have seen you in action that you're leading well and that you've, you've managed through significant adversity and you've got, UCA on a path towards long-term resilience and growth. And, and, and it's just, I, I think a lot of us are really grateful for the kind of effort that you put into it because it means a lot to the state, to not just central Arkansas, but to those parents, those students, to, to your industrial partners, it really means a lot. And the institutions of higher education that are led well are going to make a difference in terms of the overall national competition that we do, that we have to do in a very challenging global environment. So we, I think we appreciate all you do and your leadership for sure. Well, thank you. And I, I want to earn that every day, but I'll tell you everything you just said, that's because we've got a great team. Um, we've got, a, got a whole lot of folks that are pulling, um, pulling in the same and the, in the right direction. And, um, you know, again, a lot of that was already baked in the cake and in the culture before I got here. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, momentum is a beautiful thing if you can just keep nudging it. Um, and it's, uh, I think organizations are, are like old car engines. If they, if they ever shut off, you don't know if they'll start up again. Um, and I'm proud of the fact that during, during hard times, I mean, we've never stopped, but that the reason we never stopped is because we stayed focused on, Hey, our students, I mean, a lot of them to us, we're the closest thing to home they've got. Um, our, our students can't, we can't shut down on them, um, uh, because we, we are their bridge to a better future and enough people here not only buy into that. They live that every day um, that, that it's, it's, it's easy to gently nudge and keep that momentum going. Well, President Houston Davis, president of the University of Central Arkansas, we appreciate you for being with us today. We appreciate your leadership and all the work that you're doing. And uh, I guess I'm going to pivot one more time and have a final question, assuming that, uh, some of those 1,300 people that are, or, or call it 13,000 people, roughly between faculty, staff, students, and others, are listening to this podcast. They're among the millions and millions of listeners that we have. Um, assuming that they're listening right now, or when when we publish this episode, what what one thing would you say to your university community that you would leave them with? You got an opportunity to speak to them now. What one thing would you leave them with? Oh, that's easy, Jeff. It's it's a thank you. I mean, I, I there are a lot of my fellow presidents and chancellors around the country um, that are at a loss right now for not only how they're solving the puzzles today, but having any confidence about um, the future. Um, I don't have that challenge. I am blessed to have a community and I thank them for their commitment to our students. I thank them 
um, for staying focused on those things that, that mean everything to us. We talk about academic integrity. Uh, we talk about diversity. We talk about academic excellence. I mean, those things that are avid, um, we absolutely have stayed true to those um, during this period of time, and we're going to do that in the future. And, and I'm blessed to have great people. So thank you for all that all of you do to make that happen. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate you for being with us today and, and look forward to continue working with you into the future. Thank you, guys. This, appreciate this you. Is, yes, sir. This has been another episode of the Innovation Junkies podcast. Thank you for joining. Hey, folks, this is Jeff Amrine. We want to thank you for tuning in. We sincerely appreciate your time. If you're enjoying the Innovation Junkies podcast, please do us a huge favor. Click the subscribe button right now and please leave us a review. It would mean the world to both of us. And don't forget to share us on social media.